matcha is 200 uh, more yes, than... That's the most, yeah. <laughs> This is a shock. <laughs> yeah. But that's how it is. Uh, teachers are really, I mean, uh, into the online conferences. And this is one of the rare uh, initiatives, uh, you know, across the Europe. So that's why. Uh, all right, so welcome. We are on the Facebook. Uh, welcome. My name is Blanca Tatzer and I'm from uh, Primera Courses. This is the eighth Pan-European Conference on Digital Education, which is today devoted to global education, because this week is a week of global education. Uh, very welcome, all of you. The uh, conference starts on uh, three o'clock sharp and we will start there, but uh, we will take this time only to introduce a little bit our dear presenters who prepared uh, wonderful uh, presentations as uh, I saw on the uh, uh, before on the uh, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, and welcome also our participants, our dear teachers from uh, different parts of Euro Europe uh, and from global. Please welcome, uh, share with us your thoughts. Please tell us in the comments, uh, where are you from? How are you? Uh, and etc. cetera. So, uh, and uh, now I will just share my screen for, uh, our intro video. Okay, thank you very much and uh, welcome once again at this eighth Pan-European Conference on digital education. So uh, can uh, you, our dear presenters, please tell us a little bit about you? Uh, anybody can start. All right, so, <laughs> okay, I see Anna here. Anna, then you can tell us a few words about yourself. Uh, thank you, Blanka. My name is Anna Wojtych, I'm from Poland. And I represent the Center for Citizenship Education, <coughs> which is uh, the largest, the biggest Polish NGO related to education mm -hmm. with more than 25 years of experience. Mm -hmm. We support formal education and uh, I invite you to my presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, next, who would like? Not I, don't mind. I, I don't mind going. Oh, Anna. Uh, yeah, Lisa, yes, you will. Um, so, so, so my name is Lisa Fingleton and I'm here um, in a small farm on the west coast of Ireland, a mile from the sea, and we're in full lockdown now. Um, so I am very interested, I suppose, in education generally and particularly with the global context, because I think everything we do now has, has global implications. And, and I suppose I'm very interested in how do we how do we use digital because it, it has such potential there's many challenges but as i said earlier on to the other presenters i live down a very small lane in ireland and here yes we're speaking today to a reach of possibly thousands of people so i think it's it's important for us to get over the fear maybe that we might have around it or the limitations and embrace it for the greater good you know that i, I think the things we're talking about today are really really important issues for our time and this is a great opportunity for us to learn from each other and build that community going forward. So I'm delighted to be here and thank you so much for the invitation. Exactly, and uh, I'm so fascinated, you know, because even before the coronavirus, there were every possibilities, you know, to work globally, to have such or, uh, conferences with so many participants, but we were just not ready to go out of our comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. But, so in a way that is, I, I mean, uh, coronavirus itself is of course a negative uh, thing, but I think that there are some positive implications and 
uh, this um, global cooperation among teachers, I believe that is one of them. All right, so Natalia, can you tell us uh, something about yourself? Yeah. I work as a social, social studies teacher and uh, I'm a national teacher advisor in high school Marco Marulic in Split. Mm -hmm. I'm also county training teacher and the head of, uh, of the county teachers council that we have in Croatia for three counties, mm -hmm. three Romania counties. And uh, in, field, uh, in field of civic education and uh, politics and economics. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I'm uh, I'm uh, working a lot uh, in the projects. I'm a project uh, project coordinator and a member of many project teams on the national and international uh, level. Uh, I'm engaged in the promotion of active citizenship of young people, de developing solidarity, tolerance, mutual understanding, and so on. I volunteer a lot with my students in uh, NGO League for Prevention, most, most Bridge, and um, Scout Organization Poseidon. Mm -hmm. My students like it very much. And um, together with my colleague, uh, I'm chosen to make a new, new uh, to be an author of a new high school textbook, workbook, and oh so on, in, in my subject, politics and economics. Yeah. Oh my God, wow. <laughs> Somehow, when, when, when I'm saying that, sounds like, what? When? How? <laughs> because you do every day the normal work you do, you are here, you are there, you are not thinking about that. And then when you have to say it, sounds a lot. <laughs> yeah, I believe your day has more than 24 hours. <laughs> And then family, kids, and everything that goes with it. I like to travel a lot, so. mm -hmm. but it's it's okay. I'm happy. I'm 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 working on on things that I really like to do. Enjoy, so yeah. that's the most important. Yes, All that's right. easy then. Okay, thank you, Nanda. And thank you for the opportunity. Of thank course. you, really. Thank you, and uh, Nanda. Uh, Nada is a vet teacher. I work in a vocational school. Uh, Banja Osipke Lacic from SIN. Uh, I teach a lot of subjects, statistics, accounting, uh, business corporate responsibility. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm a lecturer at University of Split, uh, where I'm uh, teaching students statistics, business statistics, uh, like Natalia said, I'm also uh, author of book for Statistica, workbook, uh, university book. Uh, I adore working in school. I love my job. I love working with students. I'm involved in many projects, national projects, international, e-twinnings, Erasmus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I adore uh, I adore uh, digital uh, working with uh, digital tools. So today uh, my topic is uh, digital and green uh, transition in online classroom. So how would I say in new normal time? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, also that's you our other, yes. Also, you are a very experienced uh, teacher, so really thank you for all your... Uh, I, uh, I adore involving my students also in this uh, global actions. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, a part of climate action project, we work six weeks. Before that, I work on European uh, project for Greener Tomorrow. Uh, many e-training projects so how everybody of us said our day is uh, 24 hours yeah. to work mm -hmm. yes because uh, teaching is a mission really not uh, just a job usually uh, if you want to be a teacher you must work whole day and i think a teacher is not a person who when uh, when the hour or the clock uh, mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. uh, he, he mean it is over but our day is whole day working exactly 
and Mladen. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, from Serbia. I'm a physics teacher. I'm also from this year a teacher of natural sciences uh, too. That's a completely new subject that has completely free curriculum that makes me do something I always dreamed of, and that is I can do whatever I want in my classroom. Mm -hmm. And this is something I really like to use right mm -hmm. now. So uh, together with students, we are creating uh, the projects right now because this uh, corona epidemic we are doing uh, online mostly but i still prefer experiments i still give them some household items i like to use games mm -hmm. as the way of uh, learning and i'm always uh, uh, there's one thing i have to say there are a lot of games but not all the games are good to be used in classroom we always kind of miss that educational part of the okay. game that really needs to be there and I hope that that will change. Mm -hmm. I, I see that recently more and more games are becoming regular teaching of uh, curriculum. They're improving and uh, this is also a thing we did a couple of years ago when we created this game uh, called Hembizika, mm -hmm. with, uh, in, in which students are learning uh, chemistry, biology and physics by actually playing the game. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about that another time we are here really? today about another topic another topic yeah exactly uh all right so now the hour is already four minutes past uh, three uh, so we will start with our conference uh, welcome all the teachers that has just is, have just joined with uh, us i will soon go through the program and we will start with the first keynote but before that, I just uh, would like to invite Monica uh, to uh, introduce us to Mentimeter activity. Yeah. Um, so you have already, some of you have already actually answered some of the questions. Uh, for those who haven't already, um, please go to, um, to the comments where you will find the link to the Mentimeter. And right now, I think that you also see um, the questions and mm -hmm. already some answers. So mm -hmm. you have five questions awaiting you. Um, the first one is two greatest digital education challenges for you as a teacher. Um, and uh, when, once you will answer these questions, they will be, um, your answer will be addressed by Anna. Um, who will use that in her presentation. So thank you for all this already. The next one is connected with Natalia's presentation. It's about your association, what is glocalization? There are no right or wrong answers. So write whatever you'd like. Um, and then you have three questions that, triggers, that trigger your thinking. So why is global education actually important? Sometimes we need to be aware of what is the actual point of something to really um, do something to work on global education as such. Um, then the next question is, how can you teach about people, prosperity, peace, planet and partnership, with, which are actually five pillars of global education online? Um, the reason behind this question is that you will actually receive all the answers, not just yours, but from your colleagues all around Europe who will answer it. And um, once we will have all the compendium of these good practices, we'll share them with you um, or via email. So you're more than welcome to contribute to this whole thing. Oh, and, and I see already some contributions coming in. So thank you for that also. And the next one is, which activity connected with global education will you do with your students? That's a call to action to invite you all to try new things. And uh, once we'll receive all the activities, you can also um, get some new ideas from other people who will also answer the Mentimeter. So you're more than invited to contribute, to share your ideas, because that's the whole point of this conference as such. 
Thank you, Monica. So the main uh, idea behind the Mentimeter is to collect all your ideas regarding the global education and then we will send to all of the people who registered in the conference. Uh, so now uh, we will shortly uh, see the program of the conference. I know that you already saw it uh, in the uh, on the Facebook or somewhere else, but just uh, ju to see quickly what awaits us today. So the first presentation, Lisa Fingleton, uh, artist, writer, and uh, organic farmer, uh, will show us one project. It's called the Local Food Project. Think global, eat local. Then uh, another keynote uh, follows on global education in subject teaching. Anna Wojtic from Poland will uh, introduce us to that topic. Then we will listen to three good practice examples on global education. The first one will be provided by NADA. It's on innovative digital and green transition in online classroom. So uh, online teaching is still a challenge uh, in a way. And I'm looking forward to this, uh, that we can uh, teach also global topics through online teaching. Then Mlade uh, will follow with a topic. Do we really need nuclear power plants, IT tools to be used in the classroom? And uh, we will wrap up with uh, Natalia Palcic with the topic globalization as a combination of prosperity, planet and partnership. So that is uh, our schedule for today. Uh, I would like you also to invite all of you, our dear participants, to ask questions in the chat. And after the presentations, uh, we will pose those questions to our presenters and they will provide answers. So please, questions, 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 welcome. And uh, now I will give uh, the stage to our Lisa, Welcome on the stage. You can start sharing your screen and looking forward. Lovely. Delighted to be here now. We'll just put this on. So perfect. Perfect. So I'm delighted to be here today, and uh, it's great that we have people from all over the world with us. So I'm speaking to you from a small farm on the west coast of Ireland, down a small lane, and it's it's wonderful to be able to reach such an audience from such a from such a little space. So just to show you where we are, uh, this is Ballybunion, and we live there under the hill, on a small farm. And I suppose the big global issues like climate change and biodiversity loss are very much present in our lives every day. So this is this is our farm. And uh, this is our house, which is over 200 years old. So it presents all the challenges of how do we move into the 21st century and become more carbon neutral um, in a house that's so old and insulated and everything else. Uh, we just planted 10,000 native Irish trees also on our land this summer, um, another action around climate action. And this would have been, this is our garden. So we have 20 acres in total. Uh, we grow everything organically. We have two polytunnels. Um, we started a local um, community market for food. And um, this is, yeah, this is basically where we live. So I suppose today, I mean, I think food is relevant to all of us, whether we're teaching online or we're teaching in schools. And I don't know about other countries around the world, but certainly in Ireland, there's a big debate about, you know, schools and packaging of, you know, food in plastic and waste in schools. So I do think it's a very important issue. And um, so what, I, what I'd like to do is, I'm gonna do a little exercise with you as well to start with, just to maybe um, do something different. And then I'm gonna talk about the very serious issues around food and why I feel it's such a critical issue. So that's gonna be a little bit negative for a while. So um, hopefully you have a nice cup of tea or something there to keep you going. And then we're gonna look at some of the practical things that you can do as teachers um, or people involved in education. So we'll, we'll, we'll do a little exercise, 
we look at some of the major issues globally around food, and then we look at some very practical actions that you can take from your home or from your schools. So we'll go on here. See why my screen is stuck. Um, the joys of technology. Come on. That's never happened before. Um, hold on a sec now. Why are we? I'll just I'll just escape out of it for a second and see. Wow. The yeah, joys of technology. Time. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I just don't know why it's wow. Completely. Just I'll just stop. Somebody sharing. asked in the comment uh, whether uh, that house is your home or a school, but that's your home. Yeah. That's our home, but we do a lot of projects from our home. Everything you know, a lot of things happen from our home. Mm -hmm. Now, this is extraordinary. I'm just going to try something else. Um, sorry about this. Wow. Do apologize this is actually quite funny because this has never in my life happened before and here we are online so i'm guessing that a lot of you who are watching today um might be teaching online and have things like this happen all the time but uh what do we see now the best thing is that we all are teachers so we are used yeah. to different complications and we improvise all the time but I don't know if anyone has any suggestions because I'm really, I'm actually completely stuck here. It's not. Um, uh -huh. It doesn't work or what? I'm wondering if somebody else wants to start in front of me because this is, yeah, I'm completely frozen my screen and you're fine. But my, oh. I've never seen this happen. Gosh, All right. like so, my, pre uh, my presentation yeah. has stopped. All right. So uh, either this or I can also share your presentation. Do you, no, you know, I've, 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 sorry, but I, I changed because I wanted to put in some extra things. Um, gosh, I'm really sorry. I don't understand what's happened mm -hmm. at all. Um, I've, I've never seen this happen before. So I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm completely. So your screen totally frozen. Right, my screen is totally frozen. So if you want to show, if you want to show from your end, maybe that might be might work. It's not ideal, but because I had a little exercise for you, but that's fine. Sorry, I don't know. I don't. No problem. no problem. I will share my screen and I hope you will see it now. And also Anna is prepared to help. Uh, all right, so. Uh, Lisa, can you uh, unmute yourself? Mute. Unmute now. So we go back again. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Yeah. I, well, there you go. The joys of technology never happened before. So yes. So we're here in our garden, and we'll move to the next screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's 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 it's. So this is this is my studio. So this is where I'm actually sitting today and where I'm working. Mm -hmm. So just um, sorry, no, I had a, I had a whole little exercise drawn out for you to do. But I suppose when I think about food, I mean, we grow our own food organically here. And it's um, but sometimes, obviously, I'm out and I have to buy something to eat. And one day I bought a sandwich, a BLT, a bacon, lettuce and tomato sandwich. So I suppose my question is for you listening, is how many ingredients do you think are in a BLT sandwich, a bacon, lettuce and tomato sandwich? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, what would you guess? You'd say bacon, lettuce, tomato, um, three, four, five ingredients. Mm -hmm. So but maybe just before we hop there. So that's there's actually 43 ingredients. You can show that there now, Blanca. So mm -hmm. 43 ingredients in a in a BLT sandwich. So um, I suppose. For some of you listening, you may be in countries where you're more connected to your food. And this might just seem ridiculous that there'd be 43 ingredients in our food. But this was in Ireland. This would be a standard sandwich. And I suppose in one generation, we would have been very much connected to the land. And, you know, particularly, I think in my experience in, in Mediterranean countries, when I when I'm go, when I go there, we're, we're picking food, we're eating food and it's direct and we don't have all this processed food. So when I saw this, I was doing a workshop with children, actually, and it was just before a children's workshop. So what I did was I got the children to draw their sandwich and where all the ingredients came from. So if you can just show the next slide there. Mm -hmm. 
So, so then I would have drawn all the different things. So if you look down at the bottom of the screen, you see the BLT sandwiches. There was a documentary on recently about the 26 hands on average touch your sandwich in a factory because one person is putting on mayonnaise, one person's putting on butter. But it's also about the bigger implications of food. So the mayonnaise, mayonnaise often comes from eggs, from chickens that are in battery farms. Um, where is our grain coming from? Are we using GM crops in our bread? So is that being sprayed? Um, how many miles, how much carbon is being used to transport our food? So this is a project that's a really simple project to do with children or with adults. Pick any piece of food, any particularly processed food and start getting them to imagine where it's all coming from. And you can also get children to design their favorite sandwich and they could make ethical sandwiches. So that, that's a kind of an endless project. And people can contact me through my website, lisafingleton.com and we can, we can share ideas and, and talk about that again. So we move on to the next slide. So I suppose we live in a very beautiful place, but I'm very aware that, that there is a huge amount of trouble in paradise. I'm just gonna go through some of what I see the issues. And um, I suppose sometimes I like to think, oh, we could just live in an island and we can imagine that everything's fine. And of course I do live in an island, which is Ireland, but we're not islands. And I suppose one thing that Blanca referred to earlier is that COVID has given us the gift of being able to connect globally. So this was, I was very struck by this image online about paradise, you know, that here is this community in, in America that everything has been burned down. And I guess I'm sure all of you are watching online as well and looking at the devastation that's happening across the world. So this was just one example. Yeah. And I'm very aware that, you know, the, that climate change is going to impact on people who are most at risk and that there's 68.5 million people forcibly displaced worldwide. So the, the, the issue of where we get our food and how much that food is costing the planet is impacting on people who are most vulnerable in the world. Next slide. This was in Mozambique in 2019 um, after Cyclone Idai. And I suppose what I just um, would like us to think about is that it's not just the implication of people losing their food or losing their houses in this moment, but crops are lost and debt is increased because people have lost their seed or lost their income for how many years. And as maybe in, 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 in our world here in Ireland, we often look at these images and we never see them again. And I would just encourage you, if you're working with students, maybe to check back in around issues like this and say, I wonder what has happened in Mozambique a year later. And that we, we keep that focus on the bigger picture and, and, and on where are these farmers going to get their food and who are, who's going to feed their children for the years to come when these things happen. And they happen so fast. Yeah. So this was um, a month after that cyclone in um, Mozambique. This is our garden and this is a beautiful orchard and the flowers were blooming. We went to a conference on climate change in Findhorn in Scotland and the next slide will show you what we came back to a week later. So two hours of a storm killed all of our buds and all of our leaves. And you know that's the the kind of world we're living in now where people say oh you know it's not that serious but actually the the severity of the storms that we're experiencing are causing such damage that the leaves barely came back on the leaves last on, on the leaves barely came back of the trees last summer so another issue and if you just go back sorry another issue in relation to food is um you know um, pollinators and again all over europe i'm sure people are becoming very aware of the decline in bees the decline in insects we're doing school project here in, at the moment with children all over our region and uh, we asked them to look and see how many birds how many animals did they see and it's quite shocking in a week how little even children in country areas how they're seeing our windows when we were driving used to be covered with insects and now you see nothing when you're driving so the issue of pollination not just for the sake of the bees but for the sake of our food is a huge huge um, area of concern the next slide I, I, I chose this image, I just took it off the internet because I googled Greenfields Ireland, but just I'd ask you maybe to have a think about as well yourselves, wherever you're sitting now today, when you normally drive, whether you're driving to school or you're driving to work in, in normal circumstances, just have a think about your journey. Just have a think about a regular journey that you do. And think about the fields, if you're passing fields or gardens that you're passing, and is there food growing in those fields? Now, in some countries, this question would seem ridiculous because you're like, of course, I have my own fruit trees, I have my own.
But actually, if you're looking at this image of Ireland that we present as this beautiful green image of Ireland, we're looking at fields of pesticides, we're looking at very little um, hedgerows, very little habitat for animals. Um, we're down to, we used to have 70 species of grass in our field that we're feeding our cattle. We're down to two or three species of grass. So the next slide there. So I suppose, where, where are the vegetables? Ireland, 2% of our farms grow vegetables. We're the lowest in Europe. And it would be an interesting statistic to look at for other countries. Um, I love this image. Um, this image, again, you know, I know we can argue about statistics and everything else, but I think this is a very strong image because it shows us how humans are taking up all that block in the center. And then the brown mark, the, it's, it's about wheat, um, the earth's land mammals by weight. And each square is presented by, is it um, a million tons? Is that right? Numbers. Um, so it just, just roughly, I think it's a really good image. So you have humans and how much we take up of the planet's resources and then all the animals that are you to feed us. And the green little squares around the edge are the wildlife that's left. So the way that we're eating and our emphasis on meat particularly and the amount of grain that goes to feed us is, is what's really um, causing huge damage to the planet. And when we see the Amazon being burned this year to make way for beef that we can then import cheaper to put farmers in Europe out of business is just the whole system is, is hugely problematic. Yeah, next slide. So just to show you in Ireland how, how crazy the situation has got, there's only a hundred, we have a population of almost 5 million, but there's only 165 vegetable growers there's only five broccoli growers and we have lost half of our vegetable growers in the last 10 years. Now I could talk all day about why that is, but it just might be interesting for you to look in your countries about what the situation is for growers in your countries. And um, this is a woman, again, if you're not familiar with Vandana Shiva, I put her in there because I think she's one of the most inspiring people about food and seed and the importance of these issues. So Vandana Shiva, look her up and there's, oceans of material um, for you to use as resources with your students. Next slide. And she says, when you control food, you control society. And when you control seeds, you control life on earth. And sometimes when I say this to people, they're like, oh, that's so dramatic. And our food is never going to run out. Next slide. This was after four days in Ireland when we had snow. Now, some of you will have snow all the time, but we had four days of snow and the food ran out in a lot of places. Um, so here we are on the west coast of Ireland with a very moderate climate due to adverse conditions they were unable to get through. Next slide, we'll just click on. Again, the meat counters after four days. And I just put these in because there's a lot of talk about Brexit and Ireland. And again, you know, we have this thing of we're invincible. Sure, our food will always continue. But actually, if you look at the next slide, I just put in, you know, that Brexit, we need to be talking about resilience and food sovereignty. We are ultimately an island out in the middle of the sea. And everything that comes to us has to come to us by, by land or by sea. So I suppose if you just look at this image, and again, these are the kind of things maybe you could look at with your students, is even a simple photograph like this, you could probably get an hour's workshop out of. We're not going to do that today. But if you ask students, where do these things come from? You can work out, you can get carbon calculators online where you can work out the, the amount of carbon. Um, you know, the fact that we're bringing in <clears throat> our kiwis from New Zealand, um, fruit from, that's from Spain, the celery, um, and, the, and the fact that it's all wrapped in plastic as well is hugely, hugely problematic. Um, so chemicals are used and in the food. So these are the kind of issues that I think we need to be talking about with, with children and with students of all ages. So just some positive things, I suppose, that you can take away from today. Um, so this, um, this is somebody else told me this. She, I was saying, oh, my goodness, it's so overwhelming. Where do you start? So she said, if you start eating local food, you immediately get rid of a huge amount of problems because A, you're eating from your local biosphere, which is better for you, um, but you're also reducing your carbon. And not only that, you're also supporting farmers and growers in often rural areas who really need the income and they want that life for their children in the next generation. So by eating local food, we transform everything actually. Um, ideally, if you eat organic food, then you're, you're reducing chemicals as well and, and all the poisons that are going into our rivers and our sea. Um, animal friendly, just take a glass of water that I know a lot of people are, are turning to vegan diets or vegetarian diets, but if we choose to eat meat, to at least act responsibly and say, where is our meat coming from? And do those animals have the best, 
you know, living conditions. And then fair trade is really important as well. Again, I don't know in other countries whether it's as, as clear as it might be in some places, but, you know, not eating people often say to me oh but food is so much cheaper now but actually it's not much cheaper it's costing the people who are poorest on the planet and who can at least afford to pay the price the most and it's costing animals and it's costing really um environments um, and habitats that just can't afford this so-called cheap food somebody somewhere is always paying the price next slide um, so ideally, if you can grow your own food. Now, again, it's been interesting in terms of COVID because even the great growing projects here um, that started with polytunnels in schools are having trouble now because they're shared spaces and they can't allow students in and out of, of a shared space. But ideally, if you could have a think about in the real world, in your actual physical school or environment, you know, there's loads of universities and schools that have plenty of green areas. Are you growing fruit trees? Are you growing native trees? Are you using them to plant uh, food that then children can eat at lunchtime? I, I never understand why our hospitals and schools are feeding patients and children such poor quality food. We need to be feeding um, food that feeds not only our bodies, but our minds as well. So that would be the, the, the brilliant if we could do that. And this is even just a tiny little grower that I got in Ikea. So even if you've got no space, this is in a basement and they survive for two months, you can grow herbs and you can grow food in the tiniest of spaces. So we next. Um, and I suppose another thing is just to remember that it's particularly with COVID now, um, our local markets are still going, but you know, starting up a market, being very conscious about where we're spending our money and supporting. This is the local market in our local town. And it's been fantastic, the support that people have had all over the summer. And it means that farmers know they can grow food because they can sell the food. So that's really, really important. And you're taking out the middle person and you're dealing directly with your customers. Yeah. So this is a, a project that I started um, called the 30 Day Local Food Challenge. Um, we've been doing it for five years now, where for 30 days we eat only food grown on the island of Ireland. It is not easy. <laughs> You're eliminating a lot of beautiful things that we eat, like bananas and imported kiwis, like you saw earlier, everything else. But what it's about is trying to encourage people to really look at the ingredients that they're eating. Because a lot of time people will say, oh, but it's, you know, Irish sushi but we don't grow rice in Ireland. So the labeling across Europe seems to have changed that if I import, for example, rice, and I add two euros of value to it, then it's about the value that I add, then suddenly makes it an Irish product. So that's, that's a really interesting project to do, even if you did it with your students for a day. Sorry, turn off my alarm. Um, you know, just to see, could you eat food from your locality or your country for a day, a week, even for lunchtime when they're in school? And it's, it's, it's a really good learning process. And again, that's, um, that's online. The Facebook page is now the Local Food Project, and you can see all the resources and articles and links to that. Almost finished. So by eating Irish food, this is just some uh, a page from the book, you reduce by eating local food, whatever country you're in, you reduce your carbon footprint, you dramatically reduce packaging and plastics, you're supporting directly local growers and farmers, you're eating food that is fresh and tasty, you're resisting capitalist systems that say that food is only about profit because we know that it's not. Um, you're also engaging your community around you about issues about how we are eating and how we can be more sustainable in food consumption in the future. And most importantly, now in the climate that you're in, you're also raising awareness about climate change and you're doing something really practical about biodiversity loss. Yeah. Saving and sharing seeds is huge. And again, you could spend weeks talking about this, but it's just really important. I'm even looking here. I was looking at my table was full. These were just literally out of... Um, you know, a, a squash in the garden and I'm saving them. And the whole studio here is full of seeds. It's so easy to save seeds, um, but it's something that I think, again, we can do. And maybe even online, if your students are at home, you could be sharing, what are you saving? What are you doing? And then doing workshops and that. Yep, we're almost finished. Yeah, things like keep cups. Um, again, with COVID, a lot of places here started saying, no, we don't want to use your keep cup, but I think we need to insist that we're reducing packaging and single use packaging, especially this is the universe or the college here in, in uh, Kerry. Um, and they just said, that's it. Any student who doesn't use it will be charged 40 cent. So I think that's really important. Yeah. And um, I suppose resources, you know, there's some fantastic resources online about food and about climate justice. And I just want to highlight that book by Mary Robinson, which highlights 
um, individual cases throughout the world of people who are taking action on climate justice. Again, it could be a resource for you in your classrooms. Um, yeah. And just uh, not to lose sight of the climate strikes. Um, last year, we were very much talking about, you know, climate and the young people roll out in the streets. And now we have no demonstrations. We have no way of gathering together and just not to lose sight of that momentum and not to lose sight of the next generation who are really concerned about this and that we continue to offer their support to them. So this was last year in Tralee, seems like years ago. Yeah. And I suppose just to leave you on two quotes, um, I love this quote by Mahatma Gandhi, which is, yeah, I put in the BB, but you must be the change we wish to see in the world. I think as educators and as people who are passionate about um, working with people for change, that by us taking simple actions, by us, you know, bringing in our own food, talking to people, like I'm looking here, I have an apple on my desk, you know, that I grew. And oftentimes we forget that children, the next generation, they don't even know what a real apple tastes like or a real tomato tastes like. So by us doing it, it actually has an impact. And then the next one, um, and, and, I, and I really like this quote as well. It's so simple that every euro you spend tells the world how you want it to be. By simply deciding, you know, if, if, if I'm going and I'm buying everything online and I'm, who am, whose profits am I increasing? Amazon's profits have gone through the roof. All the big global multi, I'm just picking on them, but all of the big uh, global multinationals have increased their profits by trillions. So we just need to reclaim some of that, you know, by eating local food and by thinking of the global, we can actually start transforming the world. So look, at, thank you so much for your time. I do apologize for the technical glitch, but I think given it's a conference on digital education, it's quite ironic that that happened today and Blank has saved the day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I have goosebumps over my body because of your presentation and I really hope that a lot of teachers will firstly join uh, the 30 days local food challenge and then uh, and inspire all the students you know to also join the 30 days uh, local food challenge and through students to parents and then we can have an impact. Uh, I would like to just uh, uh, Monica, if you can help me, because I couldn't uh, uh, go to the Facebook to check for the questions. If you can maybe uh, tell me if there are any questions. They were all so grateful for the presentation. Um, until now, there weren't any questions, but maybe someone will pose them now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if there are any questions, uh, welcome very much. Uh, welcome, really. Uh, but there are uh, comments like thank you and great presentation, etc. So it was a really inspiring one. Thank you very much. Uh, so if there will be any questions, we will later address them. Uh, but now I would like to give uh, a word to Anna, uh, who will present us uh, some um, hints for teaching yes Anna, the yes, Blanca. thank you Blanca welcome everyone again um, when I was listening to Lisa I thought it is a good uh, forward to uh, an approach I'd like to share with you today uh, let me share my screen with you uh, one moment please I hope it will yes work. sure Oh, I think it works. Uh, great. Uh, so I'd like to talk about global education subject teaching uh, uh, approach to teaching. I've been uh, involved in for two years and which we uh, at my organization are, have been implementing for some time. Um, okay. Uh, I think it will be a kind of more uh, theoretical uh, speech, but please be patient, I, I get into practice uh, as well. Uh, at the first screen, you can see the, um, the scheme of global competence. So what is global, uh, global competence? Uh, you can see that it comes from PISA, so the Program for International Student Assessment, a very 
a prestigious uh, organization who holds students, five senior old students uh, every year or every two years, uh, assessing their skills level. Uh, so for the first time two years ago, PISA uh, held uh, an assessment of global competence achievement. This is, uh, for me, it's a groundbreaking event because uh, it means first that PISA acknowledges global competence is a competence that is you know, very important and required for pupils to achieve. And second, because if PISA says so, it's very likely that policymakers and um, uh, educational authorities will also realize that it's very important, it's crucial to go uh, about global competence in school teaching. Um, okay, global, global competence or global education or global skills is knowledge, but also it's values and attitudes. So it's not only you know, learning, but it's also being, and it's also doing because it includes this involvement element, uh, going to action and living what, you, what we feel and what, you, what we are. If you want, you can read this PISA assessment results. This uh, it's been published this year. It's more than 400 pages book, but I do recommend it because, because I think it's worth it uh, in your free time if you have some. And uh, PISA also uh, highlights that it's very important that schools develop global competence and that a means to, uh, to do it is precisely global education. So global education leads to reaching global competence by pupils and, um, and uh, sorry, I just lost my, uh, my motto uh, at the moment. Uh, so global uh, competence uh, is achieved by global education. And that means that school can show pupils interdependencies of our world, which Lisa was explaining so uh, so deeply. Uh, school can help pupils understand how, uh, how to analyze data, how to uh, understand the diversity, but also school is a place where pupils can experience diversity uh, and face what it means to, to be interrelated in culture and also to be interrelated in uh, economy, in, so, uh, in sociology, in all aspects of life. So uh, we have global competence, we have global education, which is a means to it, and uh, what, what is global education. You can see, uh, maybe this picture looks familiar for you. This is the motto of this conference, actually. Five pillars of global education, which are five uh, topics, five sets of topics uh, that can be covered in teaching, in global education, and they come directly from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is 17 topics to be achieved by 2030 by the, the whole world. Uh, OK, this is theory. And now uh, let's uh, get, to, get back to reality. I will, I've unshared my screen. And now I'll try to share your uh, answers you gave on Mentimeter. Uh, let me do it. Answering the question of two greatest digital education challenges you have today, nowadays. So I can see such answers as keeping students engaged, organizing activities, um, Tool, uh, digital tools challenges, the challenges, time, um, keeping my students active, uh, giving students good feedback, cooperation, organization, um, connection, resources, a lot of things that uh, I do appreciate that you have capacities to, to keep together. Why am I talking about it? Uh, well, because if we add to it global education, it's a lot. 
all these things you've uh, you've uh, provided time tight curricula uh, tooling problems uh, class management are much and if you want to add global education to it you are even more overpacked as teachers uh, than you were before so how to do it how to embed global education into your teaching um, this is what i i can propose you global education into subject teaching what does it mean um, there are two aspects uh, of teaching as i understand it it's curriculum and it's possible to embed global education topics in curricula precisely why global education can work well because it's for teachers of almost all subjects that means you can easily teach global topics on mathematics on geography on national languages um, i think physical education can be tricky but i think there may be solutions it's also for pupils of any age for primary primary schools middle schools secondary schools uh, every pupil can be reached with global topics on their level of understanding and skills. It also enables to follow the curricula, the school programs the, you, the teachers have to follow and embed global topics into it at the same time. So there is no need to be to have global education classes separately. No need to add uh, more classes. It can be do, uh, it can be done at the same time. It's also useful both for digital and face-to-face -face teaching. So uh, yes, you can embed it even now. Also, through global topics, you make classes close to current events. You make teachers, uh, make pupils talk about current events on your classes. Uh, so make learning more contemporary. Uh, classes become more attractive and last but not least uh, they are more interdisciplinary and i think there is a trend now in global in, the, in digital education times that some um, in some countries uh, the authorities try to um, limit the curricula the school program and go into interdisciplinary because there is lack of time because they want to just provide pupils with uh, with extensive knowledge, but to, to keep it in time. So inter interdisciplinarity is what global education covers as well. Okay, now let me uh, let me give some examples because it's now th it's theory so far. So here there will be three lesson plans for three different subject subjects that cover global education and are embedded in subject uh, teaching at the same time the first one is mathematics math uh, it is about vaccination uh, the author is Pierre Lassalle from France uh, and originally it's dedicated for pupils of in middle schools 13 14 years old it depends on uh, on the country when you uh, are willing to to do it this lesson so generally, the class is about developing a, com and a computer program that simulates a virus infection and the effects of vaccination. Quite a um, current topic. Um, this lesson plans has, let's say, two sides. One of is uh, one of them is curriculum and um, aims that are in the curriculum, and the second one is global topics. You can see that. From the curriculum side, this uh, class develops digital skills, it develops um, data processing and also critical thinking, because people need to think what are the pros and cons of vaccination. And when it comes to global topics, it, the topic of infections, epidemic, pandemic, and also uh, enables pupils with making with, with a possibility to make informed decisions. In future, they will need to decide if they want to vaccinate it, their children or not. So on this class, they can reflect and uh, and decide uh, what side they take. 
And also this uh, lesson plan is quite interdisciplinary because it, because it can be uh, held on math, but it, it can go also with informatics. Uh, it, uh, math teacher can work with science teacher, history and civics. So it can um, have many topics at the same time. Uh, the second example is a lesson plan for practically each national mm. language. Originally, it's been prepared for Italian by Chiara Tedeschi. Uh, once upon a stereotype, um, um, this uh, lesson plan deals with fairy tales as a genre, but also it recognizes gender stereotypes that are very strong in uh, in fairy tales, and also it um, makes people practice writing uh, writing skills. How does it work? So first of all, pupils learn about what fairy tale is, what are the, the features of this genre. Then they analyze the texts of you know very common Snow White, uh, whatever whatever uh, fairy tale teacher chooses. And then they try to create a new fairy tale without gender stereotypes, either um, switching the roles in the fairy tale or write a completely new one. So uh, they uh, do are faced with the topic of gender stereotypes and also try to act against it by, by creating new fairy tales. And again, this is quite an interdisciplinary lesson because it's both about civics and ethics and literature as well. And the last example is a geography lesson plan by Zuzana Doliova from Slovakia. And it's about the uh, island states of Oceania and the effects of climate change that are experienced there. Uh, this lesson plan is also about for pupils in middle schools or uh, secondary schools. When it comes to curricula, um, it teaches about, it provides information about Austra Australia and Oceania, about the island states. It also gives information about global warming and also there is a practical class on how to determine um, location using geographical coordinates. So people get a really practical geography skills. But on the other uh, hand, they have an opportunity to analyze consequences of climate change. So they develop critical thinking. And also they um, well uh, try to find solutions to the island states which are sinking. So they embed this proactive approach and involved approach. Uh, again, it can be geography class, but also it can be civics class, and uh, it also deals with personal and social development of the pupils. Um, these are the examples, ex the examples, and now let me give a few um, hints how uh, each of us teachers can implement this approach into your teaching. While there are trainings on uh, global education, you can use uh, materials which are already done. I mean, those ready to use lesson plans uh, you've seen before. You can also create your own lesson plans. There are hundreds, thousands of topics. You can use uh, the topics Lisa covered before. You can just turn on the TV and look for topics there. Uh, so, you know, possibilities are unlimited. And also there is a good way uh, because uh, at, this, at the beginning, um, teachers can feel um, not so confident into implementing these topics. So this, this is a good, so, uh, there is a, it's a good, uh, uh, it's good to have a network of teachers who share the same values, who uh, are convinced that Global education is a must and it's a future also of the, of the globe. And I think this conference is kind of this uh, is kind of a place where this networking can happen. 
So I encourage you to, to do it. And to summarize and to wrap up my, uh, my speech, I like to invite you to uh, um, a publication which uh, we've been preparing uh, for some time. The publication will appear uh, in December. And it will uh, contain 20 ready to use lesson plans in English gathered from uh, nine countries. And these lesson plans are for math, for science, geography, uh, also ethics, national language, and English language. And also this publication covers uh, global learning or global education. Uh, it explains what it is. Uh, it gives hints how to, how to implement into teaching. So the publication is being prepared right now. If you want to uh, have it sent when it's ready, you can write me an email and I think you can also uh, maybe contact Blanca if you're interested. And uh, just to fi finish, um, the publication has been created within the Global Issues, Global Subjects project. And if you want more, there are many also there are also many lesson plans in national languages: German, Czech, English, French, Hungarian, Italian, Polish, Slovak, and Slovene, which you can uh, you can reach at the website. Uh, the link is provided now on the screens. All these uh, materials are free, and we do I do encourage you to um, to use them because it will be easier to implement global topics with. Uh, those or other materials. Uh, thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions and I wish you a lot of luck with uh, tackling global issues, global topics on your lessons. It's worth it. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much, Anna, for your presentation. Uh, and um, uh, it's good to see that actually global education can be in literally every subject. Uh, and thank you that you uh, invited us that we see all the lesson plans in English and in other languages. Uh, Monica will share the links uh, in the chat so that also other teachers can uh, get them. Uh, so now do we have any question uh, for uh, questions for Monica? Uh, for uh, Anna? Um, there was a general question, not um, related to global education, but education in general. It was about how to encourage um, more shy students to talk in front of camera. <laughs> if somebody from the presenters uh, have an idea. Mm -hmm. we, we, we just we discovered something interesting this week, actually, because um, if it's okay for me to answer, because um, we were doing a, a project with schools and it was their first time ever to have an online presentation in three schools. And we, we did this, um, we did step-by-step -step drawing projects. So literally I was just showing the students um, a step-by-step, -step, okay? And they got so into it, I think they forgot that we weren't, that we weren't really there. It was, it was really interesting because I don't normally like step-by-step -step drawings, but they were drawing birds that were kind of getting extinct. And then the teacher just came up with this idea of, he said, oh, let's do a bird walk. And I was like, what's a bird walk? And literally the children just came up and they presented it, they showed the drawings to us on the screen. So it sounds so simple, but it was just, everybody was able to move a little bit within the COVID constraints. But even the quiet children didn't have to speak, but they were just, you know, sometimes we can focus so much on the writing or the speaking, but actually I find a lot of times children and, and oftentimes children with disabilities who don't ever get to shine or show things, you know, the teachers can share those pictures online, put them up on the screen, give a little clap, you know, there's, I think it's just a case of maybe thinking differently and um, because it is very intimidating for children especially if there's a camera in a classroom and you're asking them to come up the front um but i thought the idea of the bird walk and just literally they all walked along and showed us their drawings and sat back down so if it's any use <laughs> uh -huh, thank you and uh, there was also for you lisa another question in the chat uh, 
it was regarding the 30 days challenge with yeah. uh, the students. Uh, if, uh, so how do we teach them about the globalization, which is the way that work functions today, but on the other hand, we uh, go against global buying and uh, consume local food. So how do we, you know, balance this or how do we explain students? There's some really good resources online that show you who controls food. Like if you look up who controls the food systems, there's five big companies at the top and they keep buying out the smaller companies. So there's some, there's really simple things that you can do to look at. Um, I remember when we were in Brazil and the water companies, the little small, you know, sort of water companies had been bought up by big multinationals. So I think it's, you can literally pick up any item, usually a processed item, whether it's beans or sugar or cans of food or homemade meals and, and encourage the children to go, okay, who who makes this? Do you know, it's 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 so simple because it's it's globalization has invaded all our lives now. So I think it's a case of picking something maybe that they love to eat, and then doing those projects with them that look at the carbon or look at who actually buys these companies. For example, in Ireland, we always thought we have a, a sugar brand that's called Shukra. It's an Irish word for sugar. So everyone thinks that that's still an Irish brand because it's got the Irish name on it and the same labeling as it had when we were kids, but it's not owned by an Irish company anymore. It's owned by Nordzucker. Mm. Um, so it's just bringing, making it really simple and you don't need anything else other than a package of food to actually reach the whole world in that one item. And, and, it's, and I think it's just making it simple, even for adults. I don't think any of us realize how much um, how much what we choose to eat is impacting on the world all around us, Do you know, if that helps. Um, and as I said, there's, I put the link there to the local food project on Facebook. So if the teacher that asked that question wants to send me a message on that, I'd be really happy to share some more links. Um, but I do think somebody like Vandana Shiva, who's written so many books about globalization and is so articulate now about COVID and the implication for COVID, you know, she was even saying like, how many students, particularly she was talking about India, here are parents who are struggling to survive and now their children need internet and a device to watch so that they can interact online with teachers. You know, it's globalization is, is affecting everything every day. And, and I just kind of use the medium of food to, um, to show it because I think it's something that we all have to do. Mm -hmm. Thank so you very much. But I'm very happy to talk to anybody afterwards and, and uh, connect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, there is one more question for Anna. Uh, Anna, um, well, uh, or maybe if also others can answer that question. Uh, how can we as teachers provide global education and teach some current affairs topics that are controversial, uh, controversial such uh, a religion, without steering emotions of some people? Uh, a case in point is the unfortunate incident in Paris uh, recently where a teacher was attacked fatally after teaching a religion topic. So, uh, well, I'm afraid I don't have an easy answer to it because the topic is controversial and very hard to tackle. Um, what I can advise is uh, that it depends both on a teacher, if uh, they feel prepared to deal with this topic. And on the other hand, of the, uh, on the pupils, uh, teachers know the pupils, know how they react. Um, and uh, they may not be ready to tackle those topics. Um, another thing is that um, methods of uh, well, alternative methods can be applied, such as good uh, conversation, such as uh, dialogue, su such as debate, uh, because uh, it enables people to express their opinions um, in a safe environment without uh, you know, uh, shouting, without um, stirring emotions, as, as you wrote. Uh, so I would advise uh, alternative methods. I would advise not teaching, but talking rather. 
And I, I would say uh, it very much depends on uh, both the teacher and the pupils, if they are um, strong enough to, to face uh, such topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe uh, some uh, other uh, of the presenters would like to add something to this question. How are your experience, uh, especially teachers, because you all teach in class, so do you have any experience with such emotional and delicate topics? Natalia wanted to say. Yeah. Yes, I have to unmute myself. Yes, I have the I have the similar problem while I'm teaching politics, mm -hmm. because it gets very very emotional um, depending on from what kind of family uh, children come, because uh, in the family they have a way of um, uh, talk that uh, that they like this ideology of another ideology. So once they are all together in the classroom. Sometimes it becomes a mess when they start to argue about some argument. And it uh, sometimes is difficult to, to calm them and to explain to them that uh, they have to, to leave another person talk about something without getting so emotional into it. And that uh, Voltaire uh, once said that I don't agree with you, but I will always be ready to let you speak. Everyone has the right to speak about that opinion. So it's hard to, sometimes it's hard when controversial, controversial topic comes to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, Monica, can you share with us intermediate uh, results from Mente so that we can see? Definitely. Um, and I need to tell that we have lots of answers, so I'm really happy for that. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Yes. So the first answer was already, uh, first answers were already shared. And that this will be Natalia's part, mm -hmm. so I won't interfere with that. <laughs> And then we have lots of uh, answers about why is global education very important. Um, the things people highlighted were mostly connected with learning, with exchanging ideas, with cooperation, um, thinking about future planet. We have lots and lots of inspiring answers here. So, oh my God, 76 answers. And yes, and, this right? Yes, oh, wow, and, wow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I'm sure that you will um, read them at home when we will send them also to you. Mm -hmm. And you still have some time to um, answer the questions if you haven't already. I will share the link again. And here are also yeah, lots of answers about um, concrete activities to do online and, and also about um, which activities are you gonna do with your students lots of erasmus plus um, projects and different kind of activities so yeah i think that it will be useful to share them with you at the end mm -hmm. okay thank you very much uh, welcome yeah thank you uh, so uh, okay we will proceed soonly uh, but i really have a feeling now that maybe we have to devote one uh, time special pan-european conference about this uh, emotionally difficult uh, topics because uh, yeah. i have a feeling that it's really important for all of you i see this from the comments on uh, one side and also from the presenters because i saw that uh, but controversial you, topics yeah so that yeah yeah so i will write a message to myself uh, right, uh, so, uh, and the next, uh, so we concluded now with the keynote uh, lectures, uh, and now we are going to best practice examples. Uh, I welcome among us three teachers that will share uh, their practice. And the first one will be our uh, Nada Rakovic uh, from uh, Croatia. 
Her topic is uh, innovative digital and green transition in online classroom. Uh, Nada is a vocational teacher, uh, economics teacher in a secondary vocational school. Also, she is a lecturer uh, uh, on uh, the university and her interests are statistics, ICT and digital tools. Uh, but the most important thing about her that I would like to uh, share with you is uh, that uh, uh, Natalia knows uh, Nada and before we started the conference, she really made a tribute to Nada because Nada is a really active uh, teacher, really um, uh, she shares everything that she has, every teaching practice, voluntary shares with uh, other teachers. So I'm really glad that uh, I have this luck to meet her and that she is the part of the Pan-European Conference today. Nada, thank you very much in advance. Uh, thank you, Blanca. Thank you, Monica. I want to thank Pan-European and Primera courses that I'm here today in this big day, in this big week, Global Education Week. Uh, today, I will show some of my examples of my practice. And the topic is innovative digital and green transition in online classroom. Uh, here on this picture is my school. I'm from Sin, Croatia. Like Blanca said, I'm a vet teacher and I teach a lot of subjects. Uh, my school is a very good school. Uh, we, uh, we are an uh, e-twinning school. Uh, we are a vet, very good vet school. We celebrate vocational educational uh, skills every year. We have many projects, national projects and global and European projects. Uh, why is my topic green and digital? Uh, because in all things I do, uh, there are message from my students to the whole world. I implement the green in every project, what I teach. Uh, either on uh, statistics, accounting, STEM, and digital because uh, the work of students are made by various digital tools. So uh, five pillars of planet, people, prosperity, uh, poverty, everything is included in uh, every my project. So my students really learn to be responsible. Uh, learning online, everybody uh, have problem with this in uh, when we go on online uh, teaching. So we make the best we think that is the best. And I use many methods in my classroom. Uh, I will show now, uh, maybe I can call the event all days together. Uh, in my online classroom, I really was with my uh, students every day and I use all of these methods, uh, flipped, uh, flipped learning, project learning, gamification, research learning and collaborative learning. Why all days together? So you can see from 16 March to 15 June, we really make all of these events. We celebrate all of these events uh, where we take really care about all of these five pillars. Uh, this World's Consumer Rights Day, uh, I, uh, there in this presentation, I couldn't uh, show everything what my students do, but I to try to pick uh, some some examples and uh, I will uh, go through these uh, examples uh, mentioning the digital tools that they use. Uh, they make mind maps, posters, uh, using uh, ebooks, issue using. Uh, we celebrate global and European money. We make uh, many videos, Powtoon, virtual walls, 
uh, we make green money, we, uh, we uh, do it like green literacy. Uh, here are the student works. Uh, we make our own bank. Here are the symbols of my town from Sin, Sinska Alka, Velika Gospa. Uh, also, uh, we make some examples without ICT, uh, exhibition of all the money online, uh, where my students uh, show the money, uh, the money from European, the world, the old money. Uh, we celebrate Global and European Money Week, uh, where we, uh, it is uh, every of this project is included in each winning project, Life and Money, because I'm a VET teacher uh, and I teach my students accounting and finance. Uh, and here are their messages. Uh, these pictures are drawing uh, by their hand. Everyone has its symbol. Uh, here again, uh, digital tools, greener tomorrow for the world earth planet uh, here. Uh, I'm proud on this event, STEM discovery campaign. Uh, here today is my colleague, uh, 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 Shlivalcha. He's, uh, he's a scientific ambassador. And uh, this is uh, the second year that I was a part of this STEM discovery campaign with the topic innovative approaches to leadership. What me and my students do, we make a big exhibition. We make a, a big exhibition and uh, present it in ebook. All of our activities in online were here presented. Uh, here are the works students are preparing. Uh, they presented their works, uh, all of their needs, motives uh, are shown on this, in these works. Uh, here is another example, student action to climate change, the project for greener tomorrow. Uh, this project uh, is, uh, uh, its uh, dur dur duration is to uh, 30 of September, uh, when Croatia is presidency for the European Union. We get for this project uh, financial support, and here you will see our activities. Uh, we combat and fight climate changes. My students' messages, time is running out, and we shouldn't wait. We must act quickly. Uh, here, uh, here when we we were back to school, uh, we make these activities. Uh, this is a picture from my classroom and my students' classroom from my school. We have a big school park, and uh, our city's park is near to them. Uh, first activity is stacking branches. A student for greener tomorrow. Uh, this is a logo made by students. Uh, what the students do? Uh, we are donator. Uh, we have an echo group in our school and we make many activities. So student likes to do gloves and tools and go to clean in the park. Uh, to our action, uh, every time joined our town company Chistocha and help us because we don't have trucks, but we like to work. Uh, here they are going to the park. This is the branches. Uh, they made this. The main works you can see on this picture. Uh, they must learn how to pile the branches how to pull the branches. We, like teachers, we always join them in these activities. They can't, can't do that without us. Well, this is the next activity, nature without garbage. 
uh, here near our school, we have uh, many, you see these walls and you see the garbage. Uh, every day, some of the classrooms are choose in the school and clean this. Why? Because uh, our park is in the middle of the town and uh, the young people here eat, drinks, smokes. So uh, we take care about our environment. Here are their actions. So we call everybody to be a part of the action. Uh, Natalia is near us. Natalia, when COVID start, uh, when COVID finished, you can came with your students to us and help us. <laughs> uh, what are our pollutions? Uh, action are plant a tree. Uh, another action is afforestation. Uh, to go to uh, this activity, we are waiting uh, because the um, uh, situation in our school is hard. Uh, many students, many parents are affected by COVID. So I think that maybe on spring or summer, we will make this activity. Uh, here, we, uh, we were a part of this big, global project. Uh, my students really enjoy in this project. So what's next? Uh, we make a virtual exchange experience with students and teachers from over the world. Here on this slide, you can see the students from Poland. Uh, we make uh, 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 some, some hours exchange our uh, experience about climate change. Uh, the Poland uh, students show us their innovation. We show them innovation. Also, uh, my students have a young mentor in this project from Australia. So uh, it was very excited to them. They enjoy and they, they asked me, uh, teacher, when we will this repeat? Uh, we, we take care about use, uh, also about volunteering. Here on these pictures, uh, we take care about uh, children with special needs. Uh, we take care about gifted students. Uh, here, hard children from Africa. Every year, uh, we send them our gift now. Uh, we are preparing Christmas activities. Uh, next, what we are going to do, and we want to all of us called to be part of this big project, goals project, and bring the sustainable development goals in your classroom. So learn to be responsible because it's our world, let's take action together. Uh, let's take care about people, planet, prosperity, peace, and everything. Thank you for your attention. If there are questions, I will answer on them. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are uh, a lot of activities that you shared with us. Uh, I'm so happy about that. Uh, also, the participants are happy because they are saying to you, thank you and bravo and uh, uh, everything. Uh, and uh, yeah, mm, now uh, there is one comment. There are no questions, but there are one comment, there is one comment, uh, and I will read the comment. Uh, so, okay, I see green, but how do we make this thin line which, in, which exists between traditional teaching and online teaching disappear? I mean, can we have a real productive online teaching 
or it will still remain an illusion. We as teachers do what we can to achieve the best results. Students do the same. But there are parts of our society which do ha not have a proper understanding of the online process or the lack of materials involved in online teaching platforms, uh, platforms, laptops, internet speed, and so on. That is so one concern of one teacher. Uh, maybe Nada, if you can comment that or also all the others uh, are... Uh. I can comment this uh, because uh, I said on the beginning of my presentation, uh, it was very hard to go online teaching. Uh, everybody of us, uh, uh, we are in the starting, we investigate the digital tools, what to make. Uh, I can say in Croatia, in my country, in my uh, town, uh, there are villages where students didn't have uh, internet. Uh, uh, also, they don't have laptop, uh, and there were a lot of problems. But my school, uh, my principal, and we, we help our teacher. Uh, there were hours and hours teaching online. What we teachers made? Uh, I, I work for the National Agency uh, for VET. Every day, be, uh, I work my, uh, I, uh, I, I teach online uh, in the morning, but in the afternoon, I was recording videos for other teachers. I make uh, make a hundred and a uh, hundred videos. So I think everybody who do the best of himself in this online teaching uh, can make the uh, can make uh, uh, can make teaching uh, not the same like in the classroom, but the I. Uh, uh, at the at the beginning of this year, I I uh, I was uh, uh, I asked uh, my students make some tests. I didn't see uh, the difference between my teaching in the classroom and teaching online. So I think that I really do the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very Everybody much. who tried and worked a lot, make it the best. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, you are my, my role model. So in the morning you teach students. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, many of us teachers. So uh, we in the morning teach online, in the afternoon make uh, recording uh, our uh, lessons for other teachers, teachers yeah, that's and students. Amazing, that's amazing, really devoted. Uh, you are really devoted and thank you for that. Okay, any other uh, comments about yes. this comment? Yes, we do the same. I, I spent also hours and hours uh, recording those video less interactive video mm -hmm. lessons so that um, all the other teachers could use it and uh, could use it um, by using digital tools. So in case they are not capable or they are not educated well to use the, uh, the, uh, the digital tools, I was preparing them uh, the links so they can just uh, deliver it to the students and um, mm. learn it with them together because there are many, many teachers that don't have possibility to, to learn something uh, new because of maybe schools that are not in a central town or are in small uh, villages or don't have uh, inform, uh, dig digital infrastructure. So it's hard for them. Also many students who live out of towns don't, don't have good internet connection. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's really hard to be online in in um, in regular time when the classes are so we are trying to to make it easier by making hours and hours of interactive video video lessons and people like uh, anada are um, teaching on uh, online other colleagues how to do it and how to make their professional life easier 
Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, a master, really, all of you. Um, thank you. If we can, yeah, Lisa, please uh, unmute yourself. I, and this might be for another seminar, but I was just curious if there are any countries who have provided, because I think some of the things that seem to be coming up are about access to the technology and to the resources. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if there's any good models in Europe or around the world where governments have stepped in and ensured that this digital infrastructure is available publicly, because actually I realize what a lot of us are doing is we're feeding this mass consumption of you know new laptops that have to be up to date mm -hmm. and everything and i'm just it mm -hmm. might be very interesting to look at whether schools on a local level or even countries have really embraced this I, i'm very aware like say refugees here who are living in, a, in the asylum process in ireland they're all on pay-as-you-go phones trying to communicate with their families so if, if schools no matter how much resources we send that's eating data and how do we make it more accessible? So maybe it's a bigger question, but I, I'd be very interested to know, are there models in Europe where governments are taking this on and taking back the power and saying, well, actually, if, if a family has to buy three laptops mm -hmm. and internet connection, you're talking about thousands of euros mm -hmm. and effectively you're asking families to start paying for education, two private companies. So, so there's a bigger, it's it's triggering a bigger question for me about, about access and who controls our learning and who controls our institutions. That's another perspective. So uh, if participants, uh, if you are from some countries where there are some good uh, models, uh, is just to share with us them in the chat. Yeah, that's a, a really new perspective that you just showed uh, us now, Lisa, thank you. Okay, so we move now to uh, Natalia, uh, sorry, to Mladen, uh, Mladen is, uh, before Natalia, uh, with the topic, uh, do we really need nuclear power plants, IT tools to be used in the classroom? So uh, Mladen uh, was awarded as one of the best educators in Serbia in 2018 for both his work with talented students and career guidance. He is also Scientix Ambassador and sides on Stage Serbia National Board member. For activity he will present today, he got also awarded at STEM Discovery Week and that magic is the hand -picked teacher contest for best examples of online teaching. So uh, proud that you are with us today. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to start uh, my presentation with uh, one hypothetical question, one hypothetical situation. Imagine this, a multinational company offers to build a nuclear power plant in your hometown. Now, the local community organized a debate in order to hear different opinions. And the question is, what stance should our school take? Well. This uh, kind of situation, although highly hypothetical one, is actually something that uh, makes it now personal. This lesson is now personal. It concerns you as a citizen. Uh, but what can you do from here? You can do different things. For example, I'm a physics teacher. I want my kids to learn how nuclear power plants work. So I focused my uh, uh, future uh, activity on that. But you can also use this for economy. You can try to calculate advantages and disadvantages, risks and benefits of this kind of thing. It would re reduce the coal power, the coal based power plants, of course. It would uh, make one power plant enough to make huge amount of energy and so. But there are other things that are not so good about it. But like I said, I'm going to focus and going to stick to physics right now. Uh, what we did was very simple. We used Google Classroom as a way to for communicate. It was the easiest, not the best, but it was the easiest way. 
We also used online experiments made by FET uh, Colorado. They have the great variety of uh, things the students can explore and they do not need even high computers. And they basically all they need is a uh, latest Java in order to do that. And uh, one thing that really, really uh, helped me with this was this Android game. It's free. It has very good technical details and all the things I would say normally in the classroom or in the game, but the players have to discover them. And of course, I had to use Mentimeter because I wanted to do to hear students opinion. Now, my idea when I decided to start this one was to organize a debate to have the students in two teams, one team for the power plant, the other team against then see what evidence will they come up with. But like we said, the debate was out of the question. So we decided to just hear them what they have to say. So what we did after the introduction, I sent them uh, simulations uh, in order to help them understand what the chain reaction is, how they work. Then I gave them some time in order to play the nuclear incorporated game. And then they have to write reports and send them back to me for a conclusion. Uh, the first thing is when we presented the problem, I used the Mentimeter, Menticom, to, in order to hear their opinions. And the one thing we analyzed, all the, uh, all the things that were associated with uh, nuclear energy can actually be divided into different uh, areas, one subject groups, two different groups. One group represents the danger, the bombs, the Chernobyl, the, the other things. The other is representing the physics, uh, like uh, the fission, the air, the, the fusion, uh, the atoms, and so. So this is one thing that could be interesting to explore. And then, of course, uh, I had to set up the simulation. But uh, here, here's a big uh, problem. Uh, you can actually play with this game you shoot your neutrons from the gun and you hear uh, you see what happens so i had to create a list of questions i want my students to pay attention to i really want them to 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 be like a sort of a guide because i want them to uh, create an experiment perform it a couple of times see what happened and then they finally draw out a conclusion and of course, the game. I really believe that uh, with some help and some uh, uh, teachers stepping in in the future, there are going to be a lot more games, not just like this, but for other subjects as well. In this one, you are doing the control of a nuclear power plant and you have to produce energy, but at the same time, you want to avoid too much overheating. And of course, eventually you have to avoid, uh, you have to replace the fuel rods. And this was actually what uh, I want them to find out. I want them to find out the, the dangerous things that are here. What are we doing with the old uranium rods? How do we control reaction? What are the dangers? How many times did they blew up the nuclear power plant? How many times did they caused Chernobyl because uh, they were in too much hurry and so on. But I also want them to explore research and discover other things that uh, can be used uh, for, in, as an argument uh, for the nuclear power plants, such thing as uh, you can actually reduce uh, the number of coal plants, which are today number one cause of pollution. And the thing is, this is where it gets personal. The 10 biggest uh, uh, power plants who are uh, polluting the air, 10 biggest polluters in Europe, eight of them are in Serbia. So this is kind of a big problem we are dealing with right now, and this is something we have to deal with in the future. This is not just Serbia problem. The air goes, the air doesn't know any borders. Finally, we had this uh, 
opinion voting, where I actually wanted to do something completely different. It's not just say, uh, saying yes or no. I want to see how many students were able to set up uh, fully argumented sentences. I think it should be cause, or I think it shouldn't be cause. It's important when you say something, you have to evaluate different things. This is a real life, this is something we are always forgetting about. Them. And of course, uh, some of the students in the reports, I didn't mention that, but some of them actually raised the question who will control the proper plants, who will not control, and so on. And Finally, I had to have uh, some sort of evaluation for the students. These are the results. You can uh, check them later because we're going to be a little hurry right now. And that will be the end of my presentation. Basically, this is something that we did uh, during the COVID lockdown in Serbia. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Mladen. Uh excellent uh, exercise uh, i mean the results of the evaluation tells you everything because students were obviously very satisfied because they gained the new understanding of everything and they probably wouldn't if you would just present them the nuclear power uh, and also i can imagine that even if you are not a physics uh, teacher you can uh, have this activity in your classroom because i know if you are a social science for instance you you can teach this if you are a, a philosopher or language teacher well, we are not all going to work in a nuclear power plants and we are not all going to be physicists but mm -hmm. we are all going to be citizens Mm -hmm. And we are all going to take a vote for something. And one of the questions I raised from the start was, what do you need to know in order to answer this question? It's not just I'm against it or I'm for. You need to explore research and then you can give your opinion. Excellent. What do you need to know in order to answer this question? Thank you very much. It was really Thank you. And uh, also in the chat, there are some uh, comments uh, also about the questions that uh, uh, Lisa before asked. Uh, do we have uh, another questions maybe, Monica? Yes, uh, there was a question where they can find this game. Uh, they can find it on a droid, uh, on Google Play, uh, sir. There's one for the iPhone, but it actually charges you the money. So if you're having an iPhone, you're probably not going to be able to play this for free. Is it possible, Nadin, to share the link from, or at least the title of the game? Uh, uh, Nuclear Ring Incorporated. There are a couple of games in the series. I think that they recently closed this one and make a better version. So you, can, you might even be for luck. You might try the completely new, improved version. Okay. But just to type uh, nuclear incorporated in uh, Google Play and you will find it easy. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we move now to our last presentation. Uh, Natalia Palcic uh, is with us again. Actually, it is your second time that you have a presentation in the Pan-European uh, conference of digital education. Uh, so thank you all for your willingness to present. And Natalia is uh, a social studies teacher and uh, also she's a teacher trainer. She is an expert in the field of civic education and politics and economics. And she really has many, many activities for students. And not just that, she is also a awarded teacher and also a respectable member of community uh, there uh, in her country, Croatia, the Ministry of Science and Education also awarded her with a, recog with a special recognition. Uh, so Natalia, please share your wisdom with us. So thank you for such a nice, nice introduction. I will share my screen now. 
and um, introduce you uh, to, to one topic that my students like very much. Uh, just a second, slide goes this way. Okay, here it is. Um, they like to talk about uh, localization and uh, you will see later why. And um, it's interesting that, um, as you showed me before, your Mentimeter question uh, about localization, that many teachers were a little bit confused and they didn't know very well what localization means. That's what happens when I put that question to my students. They are surprised, like, what would be localization? We all know about globalization. But later on, they find it very interesting and um, somehow very useful for our local community. So we usually start with uh, what is localization? And it's easier for them to understand that we are putting together words globalization and localization. So that's how we get the word globalization. It refers to products and services that are developed and distributed globally in all the world but are designed to meet the needs of users or customers in local regional market. And more, of, uh, more than anything, it is marketing strategy, uh, strategy and is business methodology. How foreign companies uh, do their business in local market. Then I uh, give my students a task to, to make uh, research. How did the globalization happen? and when the term localization was introduced. And um, they, they like to make such researches and it's interesting to them to find out that it, it uh, happened just a few de decades ago, the last maybe less than 20, uh, 20 years, when companies decided to enter foreign markets and to expand their businesses. And uh, the term localization was introduced with, when those foreign companies needed to adopt uh, localization uh, to increase their customer base in foreign countries, in foreign lands. And um, this, uh, this slogan, think locally, learn globally and act uh, locally. I'm sorry, this, there is a, there's a mistake in, in one uh, letter. Uh, means uh, that best expresses the, the notion of globalization. Uh, it, there should be act locally. <laughs> okay. And what is localization methodology? First, foreign multinational companies enters a new market, then modifies its products and services to meet the demands of the consumers on local market. Then they produce uh, their products become localized so that could be accepted by the local customers. And uh, they make a product that is, in fact, a global product and that everyone can use. And its localization makes it easy to fulfill the needs of, uh, of individuals on the local market. What are those uh, customer elements of localization? Um, Localization has become a new standard in uh, building up a positive aspect of worldwide interaction, uh, may, being in a translation of text, a localized marketing communications, sociological or political aspects, and um, cultural, ling lingual, political, religious, ethnic affiliations are researched and integrated into marketing process of creating positive impression among the public. So as I said before, it is, it is marketing strategy, how, how the companies uh, research all those, uh, all those factors and integrate it into their own product so that uh, they would create positive impression among, among their public. Um, we know that globalization somehow has a negative connotation and then that we think that uh, there's no too much good of globalization, but there are many good things of globalization, especially when it comes localized. 
So uh, I'm teaching my students and I always emphasize that if something like that has to happen, let's take the best thing of it. Let's, uh, let's take the most that we can, for example. Let's, uh, let's expand in foreign markets. Let, let's make that flexibility. Let's increase sales. Uh, let's adapt it in different countries, help in connecting with our customers. And the most important thing, let's, uh, let's make employment opportunities for local people. Let's, uh, there, is a, there is a big responsibility on our local governments, on our local communities, because they shape the, they shape the model uh, where the multinational companies are entering. So uh, if we make those rules that they can sell their things here or they, make, they can make their production, but if, they, if we make them use local products and uh, that they should buy from local agricultural people or uh, employed local people, then, then we can uh, do something very good for our local community. Of course, there are also uh, disadvantages. Um, there is a chance of failure, and in that case, it's a waste of money. Uh, we need experts device because it's difficult to implement. It's, uh, it's something it's, that we need uh, to research. Uh, there is um, impact on local businesses. It's not suitable for small firms, and it's definitely time-consuming process. And then I give my students an assignment, use the internet to explore localizing forms of brands that you know or consume yourself. Uh, I, I use Jamboard for that, so I will show you in a moment what they do. After they research, I'm sorry, it should work, okay. Uh, here are the examples of localization. They are trying to find on internet some interesting examples of localization. And afterwards in a the classroom, they are explaining to me why they decided to took that picture or, or that example. Just a second, let me go back. Uh, then we finish with example of localization and I give them the, the, the question in ment Mentimeter, have you ever heard about localization? And as you can see, only 25% of them say yes and 75% uh, of them say no. Globalization is more or less uh, unknown word for them. And what is your association? It's uh, similar as our teachers uh, wrote. Uh, they, they, um, they are associated with localization usually. Then we continue with our lesson. And um, now I'm, I'm trying to give you an example what I do with my students and that you can use it without any problem in your classroom because uh, those are very usable, usable links. And if you need any help, just uh, mail me and I will send uh, more of it if you, if you want. First activity is um, class survey. Uh, we make uh, a research uh, on, um, on those questions. What is your favorite drink? Do you like Coke? What is your cola brand? How much Coke do you drink in one week? Is cola harmful or health, uh, to health? Should cola be sold in our school? And there is there is a form in Google Forms that we that we use for our research. And afterwards, we make some statistics about how the students answered those questions. Then we go further, and just a second, and we go to activity number two. That activity is connected to, to prosperity, to global economy and trade, and we do Kahoot quiz. And you can also use it um, to answer those questions. Questions are, in fact, very interesting. And I'm um, sorry, this is it. And students, uh, students like it. It's about Coca-Cola that they know very well and use it a lot. 
Afterwards, we have activity number three. It's about planet and sustainable development. We talk about cola ingredients. Why does cola keep you awake? Is cola harmful to health? Does cola consume water? And I give them PDF templates about Coca-Cola ingredients. And um, we, uh, they, they, they learn a lot uh, from it. And it's easier for them to make an opinion and to answer the question. And I give them also exa examples from the media, from different countries about um, how the citizens of those countries treat uh, that business that Coca-Cola does in their, in their countries, how much they use water. And later on, they found out that Coca-Cola uses two liters of water to make one liter of cola and many other interesting things, things that they didn't know before. Then we have uh, activity number four. It's also about planet, uh, but about it's about uh, partnership. This is wrong, okay? About consumption and production. We do uh, cola globalization research about alternative colas. Uh, there's uh, one uh, 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 nice um, research about always Coca-Cola. It's research in the world environment, how the world uses Coca-Cola and uh, what are the, the factors that, um, that are important uh, to introduce cola in their countries. And later on, we do it in our local environment. What are the factors that are uh, important for us, for our local community, for our culture, for our way of living um, about cola? And then we make a little research, cola at our school. And there are the questions uh, that we are using in that research. Where is cola produced? What do you know about the ingredients? What do you know about their business idea? Uh, what is the packaging, how is advertising designed in different countries and so on. And, um, and at the end, we are making, we are wrapping it up with localization, localization and pillars of global education. And I give them uh, the task about this because localization tackles um, all three pillars. And um, uh, I've, I've, I've put them the question also on Jabboard about, um, I will show you here, about um, what are economic aspects of globalization. Well, this is the first one that you saw because, because you can do it in just one Jabboard. What are economic aspects of globalization? What are localization aspects of sustainable development? And what are globalization aspects of consumption and production? We didn't uh, finish yet our task because this, uh, this lasts for, uh, for some time. We have two more lessons to finish this. Uh, and um, just a second. I think it's something wrong with the internet, yeah, because she just uh, disappeared. Yes, I think so. Yeah, okay. I hope she will come back uh, and, um, okay, I'm happy uh, that the majority of her presentation uh, was uh, already on. So, uh, I hope that uh, Natalia will come back. In the meanwhile, uh, Monica, if I can ask you to share the Mentimeter, because it was our plan to share it in the end, yes, in the end. Uh, so maybe we can now take this opportunity to, to see. Definitely. Um, the results are quite similar as before. Um, we got some new ideas for activities, um, also um, some are, are planning to do some artistic works regarding global education, also conferences, um, lots of project things, um, Erasmus projects. Also, I think that uh, Lisa's presentation has already made an impact because mm -hmm. yeah, this 30-day local food challenge is also included in um, many ideas and debates, literature, lots of um, activities that will be done. Um, he, 
here um, uh, about the activity, activities online. It's mostly videos, conferences, uh, platforms, or even um, or some games. So I see some Ladens. Um, Laden has also <laughs> <laughs> appeared in this. Um, perhaps they will lose, use uh, your tool also and workshops um, and also some ways of how to actually work with students are included in this uh, activity field. So it's also very beneficial. And here we have so many questions that I really um, invite everyone to go through them at their home and really feel why is global education so important and why did we have this conference today? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really uh, grateful for all the answers. Natalia, you are back. <laughs> I'm sorry, it happens. I I'm, I'm sure that all of you experienced this while remote teaching. Of course. Yeah. And it, um, uh, it happens, but uh, uh, it's okay, I'm back. Uh, something was uh, wrong with my battery. I, was, I, was, I didn't see the, the sign that it's over. <laughs> Okay, I was uh, uh, almost at the at the end of uh, presentation, and um, after they uh, answered those questions, the last uh, the last task is to to make uh, a brief review uh, of their position on localization in the digital tool of their choice. So after we spend. Um, some something like four or five school hours on this uh, subject. At the end, I hope that they learned something from different aspects and that they are able to write a few, uh, few uh, smart sentences and make their own stand on, on the topic of, um, of uh, glo localization. So uh, this is um, how we do it. And uh, thank you for your patience with me and for your attention. If you, need, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Uh, okay, welcome questions. Uh, uh, before was one question, uh, how old are your students? Uh, my, student, uh, my students are 14 to 18. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. So just to get the feeling, yeah. It's a, it's a high school, yes. It's a high school, yeah. Uh, so thank you also to you, Natalia, for another inspiring uh, presentation. I'm really grateful. Uh, and uh, okay, just we need a uh -huh, okay. All right, okay. <laughs> now we are here. Yeah, we are in, in the end. So um, I'm really grateful to all of you. Uh, and this time I'm also grateful to the Council of Europe because after eight pan-European conferences that we are organizing, this was the first institution that recognized this conference as something meaningful for teachers. So really I am thank, thank, thankful for this. All the presentations uh, are already uploaded uh, in the pan-European uh, group in the face on the Facebook. So welcome to um, to download them and uh, use them in your teaching practice. Uh, and now, uh, in the end, I would just like to invite you to another event which will happen next week already and uh, i will show you this one uh, it is just a second to all right to open the invitation so next week on thursday 26 november at 10 a.m. Central European time, we have a keynote lecture provided by uh, Dr. Christian Musek Leschnik on teaching growth mindset. So some of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with this concept. It's from positive psychology. 
growth mindset, but maybe for some of you, this is something new. So Dr. Christian Musekleshnik will introduce us the whole concept and uh, will also show us how we can use this uh, concept in our teaching practice. Uh, I just uh, uh, have here one slide on this so that you can get ideas about uh, what will be included in the lecture. Because in one side, we have a growth mindset students who are really willing to learn. And they have attitudes about learning that, for instance, I can learn anything I want. But we have other students with a fixed mindset who believe that Actually, it depends on a talent whether you can learn something or not. So I'm either good at it or not. So I don't have to learn because if I have a talent, I will magically uh, learn it. But if I don't have a talent, then I just waste my time if I put my energy into the learning. So as a teachers, we, of course, want to instill a growth mindset into the students and this lecture will be just about that mm. then another presentation another conference is awaiting for us uh, in december it will be a, a ninth uh, pan-european conference on digital education uh, you can already apply now uh, really welcome you can apply either as a participant either as a presenter. You can see now that everybody survives when they present something. So um, you are really welcome to share your best practice. Uh, so 17 December and the application is also online on the uh, page erasmusplascourses.com. Uh, in the same page, you can also find an application for the keynote lecture that will be uh, next week. All right, so what can I say? It's already four minutes past five. Thank you all uh, the um, presenters once again and to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 I know. Thank you so much. Thank you.